Hello, everyone, and welcome to another live stream Own Your Judaism conversation. I am the mindful rabbi, Moish Steigman. Uh, welcome back to another conversation sponsored by Own Your Judaism. I am excited and honored to welcome my guest today and my friend and my namesake, <laughs> Moish Katz, um, very possibly to your chagrin all the time. People will come up to me and say, Moish cats, right? You know, when they don't know either one of us yet, but no, th th this is Moish cats. Just by dint of circumstance, I have followed in your professional footsteps that's right, that's right. twice at the same school, <laughs> and maybe true. that will come up. <laughs> um, with Moish's permission, I am not going to read his biography or his autobiography <laughs> because that would take up probably the entirety of the time, and it's just a testament to everything that you've done in your life, your professional work, your personal work, uh, serving in the IDF, your incredible volunteer work, your incredible philanthropic efforts. So hopefully some of that will come up in our conversation today. And thank you very much for being here. My pleasure. Thanks for asking me. You're welcome. Thanks. You know, we were just talking before we before we started about Passover and Passover prep and post Passover. So how are you doing now that the Passover holiday is done? There is a whew, done. Yeah. On the other hand, it was it's awesome. Right? We talked before, and you've said it yourself. It's my favorite holiday. It's hard not to love Passover. Mm -hmm. Uh, 21 people at the house, a mixed bag of everybody. Um, it's also wonderful to be surrounded by that much love all at one time. Mm -hmm. um, it's also a really great space to practice certain things to see, does it work? Does it not work? Is this falling on deaf ears? What's, who's, who's responding to this? It was a wonderful, wonderful, really, I, I loved it. It was, thanks. It was great. Wonderful. Yeah. Do you host every year? Um, it's been interesting. Obviously, COVID has kicked us all a little bit about this. We yep. did a little bit of that online with some people uh, for a couple of years. Um, the answers we have <laughs> in shifting numbers and, and it was really very sweet. Somebody said this time, we had no little children at our house. We had our oh, kids wow. in our home, which is great, but our kids are now 27 and 29. Yeah. Not exactly the same thing. So we actually laughed about the idea. Wouldn't it be great to bring our old friends back with their kids who have right. grown up now and have them. So maybe we're actually we're going to do a different theater next year and see what happens. With cool. Them. So, yeah, it'll be interesting. So what did you do for the Afi Coleman? I think that's the it's, classic no, it's, question. It's funny, when this, you, that's yeah. what was so crazy because yeah. it wasn't it wasn't nobody was looking for. It. Right. There were there were no kids. So it was like who cares where it is or isn't and yeah. i honestly don't think that anybody really looked for it even i gotta think for a second we had no search for the afri coleman well let's get everyone back let's we'll do it all <laughs> over again yeah i mean what was really beautiful about it is we talked about our seder plate being such a uniquely different seder plate because of course we have an orange because that's what a lot of people are doing mm -hmm. um, but we also um we have a beet on our plate instead of a, instead of a shank bone because right. we're a vegan family right and the idea of having just a bone on our plate just doesn't really thrill me all that much right i actually believe in the heart of hearts that when the mashiach comes um we will not have to sacrifice animals we'll sacrifice tofu and, yeah uh, and you may be some sage <laughs> So well, I don't think we have to wait until the Messiah comes. I think to we stop can start doing that now. Yeah. I think it's a pretty good thing to not ever have to do ever again. So yes. Um, but anyway, so we we have that. So we have a, a beet on our plate, actually a roasted beet on our plate. And then there was a really nice thing that was done this year that many families um, did. We couldn't necessarily find one, but the, we talked about a star fruit. Mm -hmm. The star fruit this year was actually a a, a nod towards the um, the trans community, mm -hmm. and to just if nothing else, acknowledge it. If you don't want to get into the discussion, you want to get into an argument with among among family and friends because. Who knows who's where, but it was a great thing for us to even to bring up. Uh, we obviously talked about Ukraine. We talked about a lot of other subjects that were that were hot topics. Mm -hmm. um, but it was just again, like I said, it was just a very warm and cuddly space to be. It was it was great, and it went quite late, so it was nice. Yeah, well, wonderful, nice, yeah. wonderful. Still recovering? Oh, nah, done. <laughs> You're done. Uh, Excellent. <laughs> well, well, thank you for your time, and we'll, we'll just start. You know, tell me a little bit about your <sighs> Jewish life and your Jewish journey. And I know there's no little bit, but yes. Sure, so, a little bit, please. It's really, it's it's interesting. I, I've had a, an incredibly blessed life with two really wonderful parents that really set the, kind of set the stage. I had a father who was probably more obsessed with life than any one person should be. Mm -hmm. um, but the result of which is that for the sake of his kids and his family, we got the, we got the wonderful results. We got to see the world. We got to travel at a very, starting at a very young age. We were surrounded by great art, by great music. Um, by great circumstances. So that was the one side was him with this kind of a limitless scope to what he wanted to do with the world. Um, and I'll actually, let me remind, I want to get back to that in a few minutes, but 
Um, and then I had a spectacular educator for a mother, a woman who was just this kind and generous, and we called each other our spiritual guides. She was just this exceptional human being whose actually birthday is coming up next week. And um, she was wonderful. She was one of these amazing women. So between the two of them um, and a sister and a brother that, that were um, enriched with strong Zionist roots, traveling to Israel since 1967, we were the first plane to arrive in Israel post Six Day War. Uh, we literally flew to England on, on June 5th, mm -hmm. uh, which was a pretty important date. Um, got to the airport and they said, sorry, you can't go on. There's a war in Israel. So we traveled around England and went to Stratford and Avon and had a wonderful time. And six days later, the war was over and we, my dad made a couple of phone calls. And in fact, we could get on a plane and we literally landed and there were still um, literally dead bodies on the side of the road in Rafiach. And there was still oh, wow. smoldering tanks in the deserts. So, I mean, I can close my eyes and still see all that as a seven year old child. Wow. Um, then I went back in in six, summer of 68 and summer of 69, we moved to Israel for five years. Actually, it was supposed to be for a year. And then we stayed for five years. We would come back to Milwaukee for the summer. Mm -hmm. My dad would come back for a month or so here and there in winter. Um, so we became Zionists in the classic sense, not just because it was something we could think about, but because it was a very tangible space. And for me, I was a street rat in Tel Aviv, literally. <laughs> I was just like, learned how to whistle without my fingers and very yeah. loudly and learned the language very quickly. And it was a, an incredible experience. The pleasure additionally was that every time we drove, we flew to Israel for very little additional cost, not for flights, but for hotels, we would stop someplace in Europe along the way. Mm -hmm. And we visit sites, Jewish sites in Europe. We got to meet amazing people. And we, like I said, we were surrounded by museums and just culture. And it was just really, I, I was an incredibly blessed life. And I, what I wanted to get back to is I had a, I had a friend in Milwaukee who mocked the fact that we traveled as much as he did. And he thought, well, you're spending so much money on travel. It was really kind of, and I was a 12 year old, 13 year old kid. And I was offended by that. So I turned to my dad and said, dad, you need to know this happened. He said, well, let's talk about that. And he sat down with a piece of paper and pen and said, what, where are your friends? What are your friends doing? I said, well, they go to baseball games and they go to basketball games. And this is the Bucks and the Brewers and the like. And so my dad started writing down numbers of what it would most likely cost for tickets to these games, mm -hmm. memberships of different country clubs, the different things that they were doing, no judgment, just right. as a cost effective, you know, and cost analysis here, cost analysis there. And in fact, there was no difference in what we were spending in travel going to Israel and what they were spending on things doing here. Right. And he says, this is a choice. This is a choice we made. And if you're not happy with it, we understand that. But this is the, and I'm thinking, not happy with it. <laughs> I mean, um, and it was interesting because the, you know, growing up with a second language isn't just a cultural way of seeing the world differently. It's an ability to actually understand more of the world you even live in without that second language. And that's, right. uh, that was pretty, pretty wonderful. So. That's amazing. It's also a really cool language. I mean, Hebrew happens to be a pretty awesome. Yeah. Dead language they became alive because of one dude named Ben Yehuda. That's it's a great story. It's an amazing story. Right. You think of what can you do? You know, it's like yeah. he literally, literally revived literally. the language that had been dormant for dormant nearly for, two millennia. It's, it's really, yeah. it's an amazing. And that we have modern Hebrew language that is smart enough to use words that make sense to not change. Like right. a telephone ought to be called a telephone. Exactly. It's called the Sachra Chok, right? There's an actual Hebrew word for it, but who's going to say that? Yeah. So it's still telephone. Um, and, you know, Nam is a pajama, but well, we're not going to call it pajama and Nam because why would you? But the fact that there's a Hebrew language for a computer is really cool mm -hmm. because it's, they use the same root, root word for knowledge or for thinking, and then they made it mecha mechanized, and it's not even a mecha mechanized thinking thing. Oh, yeah, that's a Akshav is a computer. Yeah. Cool. And it still is using ancient language to create modern technology that's sensational so yeah this it's an amazing language so Excellent. thank you ben yehuda yeah thank you <laughs> you know it is and by the way i should tell people i have prepared less for this conversation than i i think this may be conversation number 20 than i have for any other conversation um I take it as a compliment <laughs> yeah take it as a compliment because what I am finding the more and more we speak and get to know each other is I feel like the more I get to know you, the less I actually know about you <laughs> just because of everything you've done. And when I read your, your biography and as we continue to talk, the impression that I get, and I could be on and I could be way off, is there's always been a sort of consistency and constancy to your Jewish life and to your Jewish living. It's not to say that you haven't vacillated about things or wrestled with things, but it seems like it's always been a central part of your identity, who you are, how you are, 
um, how you look at the world. Is that a fair observation? It's it's interesting. There was a there was a probably two week period between high school and college where I got to Madison and I'm sitting in my dorm room um, where I actually thought I'm kind of done with it for a while. I was hyperactive in Beitar or youth group in, in mm -hmm. high school. Um, I was again, I got back to the States when I was 15. So between 15 and 18, I was kind of lost at Nicolay. I, 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 I had a wonderful high school career, but it wasn't it wasn't the raw rock career that many people have. It was just it was different for me. I can mm -hmm. said I was involved in the Zionist youth movement, traveled to New York for camp, summer camp and things like that. But it was not um, it was in many ways stepping back from the less active Jewish life I had in Israel because you simply lived the Jewish life in Israel as an right. Israeli. When I came back here, I went to college thinking, OK, I'm kind of done with that for a little bit. Let me let me not do this. And I'm sitting in my dorm room. Um, and I heard um, yelling in the streets on Madison on State Street and I okay. looked out my window and there was a demonstration walking down State Street and I heard the uh, slogan was, uh, Begin and Hitler are the same, the only difference is the name. Hmm. I thought, okay, this is a problem because Begin's a friend, right? We actually had the opportunity to sit in Menachem Begin's home for a Shabbat dinner. And you can't say that. You can't talk about a person like this. Actually, I'm sorry. Yeah, that was in 77. So yeah, so that's when. And I thought this is just this is just awful. And I literally jumped out of my chair and ran downstairs and walked around this rally and was like just furious with this. And it hit me, you don't really have the opportunity to not. Mm -hmm. um, and the thought that I could just forego the act of Jewish life or just being actively innerly Jewish just wasn't really much of an opportunity. So I kind of stopped doing it then as well. And I got active when I, especially when I moved back to Milwaukee, I got very active at Hillel, at EWM. I founded an organization called Coffee, the campus organization for Israel. Oh. Um, and it was just one of those things where I just, I dove back in. And then immediately after I finished college, couldn't move to Israel fast enough. And uh, that was it. I kind of never looked back and I never thought about it again. I was asked many years ago by, by a family member, wouldn't it be great if we could stop being Jewish for a day? And I, I understood the idea of just having one large yoke off your shoulder for 24 hours wouldn't be a bad idea, but it's become really comfortable. Like I yeah. can't imagine not wearing this coat of many colors. It's just yeah. is, this is who we are and it's pretty spectacular. Yeah. I also kind of like it. I, yeah, I do too. <laughs> I I'm really, glad. really love being Jewish. Yeah. There's just like nothing about this that I don't, that I don't like. Even even the challenges, or I should say, especially the challenges, because that's the space where you get to dwell more. Um, I love the word linger, where mm -hmm. you get to just kind of linger in that space and, and and think more about it and try to be more conscious about what does it really mean to think this way about a subject or to look at it through this perspective. So, yeah, you, you know what you're talking about, maybe not being Jewish for a day. The, the thought exploration takes me to I don't know if I could simply take away being Jewish for a day and retain some of the other, other core parts. things about who I am. And, and yeah. I'm not saying the positive, but they're just so indelibly connected and intertwined that so much of my my worldview, so much of my mindset, so much of how I try to live and interact with this world comes from Jewish wisdoms, from Jewish teaching, from Jewish living. So, I don't know, I could just remove it. I, I will tell you an interesting story, and I, and I won't mention his name because I, I don't want to embarrass him, but mm -hmm. there's really no, no reason to, because it's a great story. But a friend of mine who was, in, who was a, a vendor, it's a person we bought a lot of, refrigerator ranges and stuff from the past. He said, I work with him for literally 30 years. Um, one day he asked me why I never price him, why I never challenged his pricing. Mm -hmm. I said, well, let me tell you and teach you a little bit of Talmud. And I talked about the fact that there's a section of Talmud that, that says you shouldn't go into a shop and make a shopkeeper think that you're buying something. If you're, right. just, if you're just looking, tell him you're just looking. You're not buying anything today. Don't get your hopes because you don't want to Give him a false impression because in his mind, you know, I have to replace the refrigerator. Do I do I buy a newer one? Do I buy a white one instead of a beige one? All those kind of things are going through his mm -hmm. head. It, the Talmud tells us to not do that. Mm -hmm. And he says, so why are you telling me this? Because you need to know that if you ever, if I ever found out that you were giving me a bad price, I would never do business with you again. Right. But on the other hand, I'm never going to put you in a position where I'm making you not want to do your business or do something that you shouldn't do for your own sake. I love the fact that I'm using Talmud to consider how I'm going to behave with somebody. And he loved the fact that actually I shared that bit of thought process with him. 
And he said, you know, what's interesting is that I probably never would have done it anyway, but all the more so now would I never think about, you know, making an extra penny on you. Because why would I? If this, mm-hmm. if this, if we know we're going to have this kind of relationship where I trust you and you trust me and I will always buy from you and you always sell to me, then why would I look for anybody else? What's the, what's the purpose behind this? Especially if he's a mensch. And in this case, he's not just selling me product. He's a really good guy. He's a really fun person to buy from. So yeah. Yeah, it's the it's you know, is it most cats buying product from X or is it the fact that, yeah, we have a relationship that goes a little bit deeper than just simply I trust you. It's yeah, I don't mind that. It's that that's that bag. I don't mind carrying with or the, I said before the coat of many colors. Yeah. I don't mind. I don't mind carrying. I love that so, story. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> you. You know, you, you also mentioned that in some ways the thing you. Um, oh, what was the word you used? Well, dwell yeah. most in or, or linger, the cha- linger, linger, linger. Yeah. linger. Uh, that you linger most in the challenges. Uh, I'm always curious to hear what you perceive the challenges to be. That, that that's up to you if we want to go in that direction. But why? Why do you gravitate toward the challenges? Uh, especially because Judaism has such a wonderful history of joy, of celebration. We just talked about so, it. Passover. Why do you dwell on the challenges? So from teacher to teacher, this is one of those easy places to speak because there's no question. I I am a, um, I can't say enough how much I despise when Judaism is taught as, as death and gloom Judaism mm-hmm. or doom and gloom Judaism, right? Yes. They try to kill us, we won, let's, let's eat. eat. That can't be the way we look at Judaism. As you just said, there are so many amazing spaces for us to celebrate the richness and joy and pleasure of Judaism. Why do we always have to dwell in the, in the challenges? I'm saying the challenges are a space to sharpen your or hone your, your senses and to really mm-hmm. sharpen your, your conscientious understanding of why Judaism takes this stance or this or that. And, and, and we can use, use a horrifically challenging conversation where we either are or are not having an abortion right now. Mm-hmm. There are very, very clear um, Jewishly differentiating values on, on abortion for and against. I love the fact that I know enough of that to bring that into a conversation. Mm-hmm. Why don't I want to have the conversation with somebody else? That's the space I want to dwell in. It's not so much that it's going to change my mind one way or the other. In fact, if anything, it continues to be a fochba, fochba, right? Keep turning it over, keep turning it over, and keep finding the spaces where you're going to make something different. I always tell somebody, I, I think this is a really great way of looking at it. I actually use this at the Pascal Crusader, talking about a friend. Um, when we drive from space to space, uh, from point A to point B, you usually see the same thing every day because that's where you drive from point A to point B. Right. And there's it's a challenge that we should actually take a right-hand turn instead of a left-hand turn or get, take a longer way to get there. My, my mother always used to say, take the pretty route, mm-hmm. always. And she was right. But not only is it point A from point, from point A to point B, if you took a bike, you're going to see it even more different. And if you walked, you'll see it even better. better. Yes. If you scuba dive, you'll see it in a completely different spaces. The water temperature changes. The color of the water changes because of the light or darkness or sun or rain or clouds. The way you can w- swim by a reef one day and go to the top part of the reef or, go, or change your height by, by inches and see a whole new set of life you've never seen before. That's what I want to dwell in. That's the lingering space I'm talking about is how can I read um, at the Passover meal, the idea that we've got four or five rabbis who have gathered together who didn't even leave, live during the same time period. Mm-hmm. Yet the assumptions, well, they always met. Well, actually, if you knew the subject, they didn't know each other. It's possible they weren't even in the same, ever in the same space with each other. Um, I have a wonderful little piece of art at home, uh, uh, of, of, um, of Bialik and Gutman actually speaking, like a self-portrait of Gutman on this. And it's just this really amazing thought that these two guys were actually at a coffee shop thinking with each other, talking to each other. Maybe it happened, maybe it didn't. I, I will yeah. never know. Those four or five rabbis hanging out together, maybe it happened. It couldn't have happened because they weren't alive during the same time. But the fact that we have that dialectic, that conversation in our head, love that. Love to be able to be challenged by that, or, or at least nothing else to be thinking about it, discussing it. So, so when you're talking about challenges, you're not talking about you know the challenges that a Jew faces in the modern world. You're not talking about the hatred, or anti-Semitism. Not that they're unimportant. Not that we shouldn't talk about them. But when you talk about lingering in the space of challenges, it's that Judaism has something to inform you, to inform Absolutely. us about challenging conversations. They can challenge us as a person to grow. They can challenge our society uh, in a positive way. Those are the kind of challenges. Absolutely. And by the way, but I'll even I'll even take what you just said about society because I actually believe. Um, 
I'll give credit to a friend who always says it's never but it's and. Yes, the, the I actually learned that because I, I I would do uh, improv comedy classes okay. at uh, oh, what's it called? Oh, um, the, um, um, comedy sports. Comedy sports. Right. Yeah. So I took a whole bunch of improv, improv comedy classes. That's the first rule. You don't say no, but it's always it's and. yes and. Yeah. So the 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 notion that we have a way of. I'm an event last night at Sherwood High School, um, challenging us with what's going on with racism, a history mm -hmm. of racism in America. Wonderful movie. I unfortunately couldn't stay for the talk because I actually needed to go to the Jewish Museum in Milwaukee for another event on um, on whether it's purging or looting from the um, um, during during uh, uh, the degenerate art. Oh. Spectacular! If you've not been there yet, please go. Really, really wonderful. Anyway, so there's a lecture there. But back to the first part about racism. The racist is a chauvinist, is a is a is an anti-Semite. It's very rare that you have a racist who's not pretty much of a bad person in many other spaces. Um, I, I believe that the mensch that we're, tr we're all trying, we all hope others would want to be, um, is a space we can get others to be in. So I actually believe that there are spaces in Judaism where we can learn how to be a better a better human being, a better mensch, mm -hmm. and therefore the modern conversations about anti-Semitism and everything else are absolutely on my mind and absolutely spaces I want to be in. I also believe that it's our responsibility as Jews to always meddle in those spaces and always be in those spaces. Um, I love the fact that when um, when I talk to my cousins about who are my favorite rabbis, yes, it's Soloveitchik, yes, it's many, many others, but it's absolutely Abraham Joshua Heschel who talks about his feet doing the prey. Mm -hmm. That is a space that we can't not be in, um, that is a responsibility that we have to be. You can't be Jewish and not live in those spaces, I don't believe. Um, yeah. <laughs> so in a moment, I'm going to ask where you put yourself into those spaces, in, just in case that's an on the spot question. Um, <laughs> if you're ready right away, go ahead. Yeah. So, so where do you put yourself in those spaces? Um, there's there's a controversial virtual space I'm in circumstantially. I am on the board of the America's Black Holocaust Museum. Um, mm -hmm. The name alone is controversial in the Jewish community. Mm -hmm. And I get it. I understand it. I don't want to diminish it. I don't want to reject it. I don't want to do anything with it. Um, but I also want to recognize that there is a part of my heart that says you cannot talk about black life in America, specifically the origins of black life in America and the hundreds of years of slavery and of the horrific life they led and not say that that was not some form of a Holocaust. Mm -hmm. Is it the Holocaust with the capital H the way we've owned it? Probably not in the same way. Right. Um, right. But is it not something we need to look at? And as a person, as if we really believe, remember Passover, the whole door or door, if you really want to believe in every generation, every generation, a person every... has to see himself as if they came out of Egypt. If that's really a space we want to dwell in and live in, then damn if we don't have a responsibility to understanding that. So it's with pride that I'm on that board, parallel to me on the board of the Holocaust Education Resource Center of the uh, Walk Jewish Federation. So mm -hmm. those are two boards that I serve on and with very different purposes and very different spaces. Ultimately, they are to challenge our racist the world that we live in, an anti-Semitic world that we live in, a responsibility we have to really raise the conversation in spaces that are not necessarily easy and not necessarily fun. Although there are some people in our community who are having a lot of fun doing it and making a lot of really wonderful sense out of some really, really dark and dark and gray areas. So, yeah. I'll tell you the last time I had that conversation about whether or not the Black Holocaust Museum should use the name Holocaust. Mm -hmm. Do you want to take one guess? I won't give it a try. It was with my eighth grade Jewish studies class at Milwaukee <laughs> Jewish Day School. Moshe is laughing because during the intro, I mentioned that twice I have followed Moshe professionally in the same organization at Milwaukee Jewish Day School. I'm actually in the first graduating class. Uh, my mom was a longtime teacher there. Uh, my son, Matan, was the first third generation student there. And when I moved back to Milwaukee in the summer of 2012, uh, I essentially took over the position that, Mo that you had at the school. And for how many years, 20 some? I taught there for a total of 21 years. For 21 years, Moshe was teaching, in particular, the 8th grade Jewish studies yes. class and taking them on a trip to Israel. He was teaching about the Shoah for time yep. and teaching about Israel. So we just had that conversation when we were talking, when we were teaching about the Shoah. Should we refer to it as Shoah, as the Holocaust? Should a museum like the Black Holocaust Museum use that word? What are our effects? So we just had that well, conversation. So I, I wanna, it's, it's a small correction, and I think it's an interesting correction, is it's not 
the Black Holocaust Museum. It's actually called America. The Americans. Apostrophe, yes. America's. Black thank Holocaust you. Museum. Thank and you, the reason you. it's important is because yes, yes, it is yes. part of the name, right? It's part of a responsibility Absolutely. that the name isn't... The experience here is Correct. different and unique, Correct. and we're trying to Correct. center on what happened Absolutely, here. Absolutely, yes. yes. And the responsibility that America has to it, right? Thank you. Unlike in that, it's, it's really what's, what's fascinating. I was a docent at probably my favorite job I ever had. I was a docent at the um, Beta Tutsot, at the, Amer at the then Beta Tutsot, now it's called uh, Museum of Anu, mm -hmm. uh, our, our, our People's Museum. Um, and the, the Das Museum had a whole middle section that was dedicated to doom and, doom and gloom Judaism, mm -hmm. right? That there's this rich, amazing story all around it, but there's going to be a center column that talks about Tisha B'Av and it's the Holocaust, about, about the Holocaust, about the pogroms, about everything else, and it's in one center space. And on the one wall in that space, Abba Kofner, the brilliant mind behind the museum, attacks Germany specifically and calls out Germany and calls up German population and calls up the leadership of Germany for the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. He does not mince words. He goes right to the core and does this with the intent of saying, look, yes, it happened throughout Europe. And yes, the Ukrainians participated and the Poles participated and the French, but everybody participated, no question about that. However, Let's remember its origins. Let's remember exactly what happened starting in the 19, early 1930s. Again, back to the generate art. Mm -hmm. 1937, they're stealing their own art out of their own museums, putting it on display saying, this is bad art. This is not good art. If that's not writing on the wall for us, what is? They're burning books. If that's not writing on the wall for us, what is? So that's already happening in the 30s. So in Kopner space, Germans, the same exact place that the museum here is saying, America's Black Holocaust. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to recognize that I have a very, um, I, I give the pun, I have a very dark collection of, of stuff that is um, from the worst time in America of um, memorabilia, uh, including a slave ownership document of a, um, it is a document of a will where he's literally willing a slave to another person and there's a value for the person for human life mm -hmm. i own that because if i didn't own it who knows who would own it and my goal in life when i'm no longer around is to donate all this to some institution that's going to care for it the way i hope i have i've brought it out it was a teaching tool actually at the mock Jewish day school oh. on one particular day for martin luther king day i actually brought it in brought in a horrific piece whose name i will not will not ruin your 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 uh, this discussion with but it's a bank um, and there's a horrific image. And I brought it in as a piece to share with the children and say, look what happened here. And on the back of it is a registration word, US patent number. Mm -hmm. On this horrific, gross thing, there's a US patent number. What does that say about us? Somebody took responsibility for it. Somebody allowed us to be patented. Um, what is that? And whose responsibility is it? So yeah, I serve on that board. I love it. Yeah. That, that's amazing. That's uh, amazing. Yeah. Thank you. That's my honor. My pleasure. Yeah. You know, I, I got one more thing oh. I gotta tell you because it's oh, something because it, it's it, we can't we can't Israel has, has continued to play a role in my life for a long time now, right? 1967, 2023. It's been a, a few years of my of my being. Um I'm going back there again in uh, in June mm -hmm. um, for still have an apartment in Tel Aviv, still get to go back, still get to enjoy it. Um, I never had, we had some cousins that we met along the way uh, that were wonderful and great. Uh, unfortunately, the next generation is down. We have not really kept much in touch with them. So the best lives, and by the way, I have cousins. I have my nieces and nephews now in Israel, so I'll get to be with them and hang out with them, which is wonderful. But the, the what I have there are friends, and I've had friends there now since those days, whether it was the way back to the 60s or the 70s or the 80s and over the course of time. Israel has become a place for me that is, um, I, I've said this often, I like me more there. Oh. My guard is down there more, and I just get to be me. Interesting. Um, I'm still finding myself defending Israel's right to exist here. I don't ever really have to do that there. I still defend why why I need to celebrate a holiday here is just what's done there. Um, so I get to just have a, <laughs> my, my, I think my heart rate, which is pretty low in the first place, gets <laughs> even lower there, which is kind of nice. There's a side of me. So when I talk about living a Jewish life, I have to admit there's a living a Jewish life there that is somewhat easier, even though society is more challenging there. Like driving there is challenging. Yeah. Um, 
buying stuff there is challenging. Yes. Um, just life yes. is more challenging. Yet there's just I I I thrive there. I really do. Like I I just I I, I love it there. You might not want to answer this question in a microphone, but why are you living here? I'm um, glad you are. Don't get me wrong. That was just a actually, subtle hint. I'll, I'll answer yeah. with what Deb thought. When I first met Deb. Deb is Deb is most of my wife. Yeah. Life. Yeah. Um, when I first met Deb, when we started dating, um, she actually told me a while later on, she says, I didn't understand why you were here. I didn't understand like why you were even dating me. Mm -hmm. And I actually thought that why would I want to fall in love with this guy when in fact any minute now he's just going to take off and go back to Israel. Right. And, 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 right. She, she kept, she's like, so, so are we okay now? It's, like, it's been a few years since then. Are we, are we, yeah. And the truth is that I don't have an answer. I, I can't say this is why, mm -hmm. because there's a, there's a part of me that always will feel what if, but the answer to the, what if is that what if would be different? I wouldn't have Gabe or Sid. Mm -hmm. What if I wouldn't have the same relationship I've had with people like you with my 21 years of the day school with my work and all these other things I've, I've been shared the board of all these wonderful organizations mm -hmm. and I think making moving needles here and there. So what if I don't know, I, I really don't have an answer for that. It's sliding doors, right? right? You don't know what would have happened if I would have turned left instead of turning right. Um, I do know that there's a certain um, certain duality that I have not dual loyalty, but a duality mm -hmm. that I have to actually um, live a life there and get to have a live life here. I mean, that's, it's a, I guess, bluntly, it is a certain privilege. It is a certain blessing that I have that I get to do that. Um, and at the end of the day, what I found, like when I got, I got, <laughs> I was given, I was a high in my, in my basic training, which means I was an outstanding soldier trainee. And mm -hmm. it was not just of my class, but it was of the, of the unit. And um, when I was, my sister and I actually, my sister also got the same honor. And um, and when it happens, it was like, I I was a Maccabee. I wasn't just the, you know, I was, I had a, I had a wonderful job in the army, but but it wasn't, I, I was a Maccabee. Mm -hmm. I wasn't, I wasn't just somebody who was around in the eighties as a soldier. I saw myself as a lineage of a heritage that I was, that goes back to King David. That was cool. There was something about that, wearing a uniform that was with that kind of heritage is like, I couldn't ever get that here. Yeah. I was chair of the board of the Walking Jewish Federation. Man, I'm not sure that was the same. <laughs> Quite the same thing. <laughs> Probably raised more money as a chair of the Federation than I did right. there, but you know, we'll find out where you fought more battles, <laughs> right? <laughs> actually, here. <laughs> there you go. Absolutely here. Actually, that was an uncomfortable segue to what I wanted to go to next, go which is you, you are immersed in so much of the Jewish world here in Milwaukee. Um, in different congregations and different communities. You seem like someone who feels very comfortable in different Jewish worlds. You seem like someone who is welcome in very, in many different worlds. And we know this is not unique to Judaism that a lot of times you have different viewpoints, different perspectives, and sometimes the internal enemies are the worst. Yeah. How have you found a way to be able to navigate different sectors of Jewish life? How have you felt or, and or brought them together? So I, I wanna give Rabbi Tulushkin part of the answer. Rabbi Tulishkin wrote a book called Jewish Literacy. Mm -hmm. um, and his, I don't believe naive. I believe his dream was that if, in fact, and he says this in the introduction, that if we all read, collectively, we, Jewish, non-Jewish, mm -hmm. read Jewish literacy, we would all be literate enough or more literate enough to have better conversations, deeper conversations, mm -hmm. live a more bold Jewish life, whatever. Mm -hmm. Somewhere along the line in my Jewish living, here and in Israel, anywhere, um, I was very intimidated by the others, whether they were smarter than I am, they were more religious than I am, they were more Jewish than I am. And I don't know when it happened. And it could be one of the reasons I went to get a master's degree when I was in my 30s. Um, it could be why I continue doing the work that I'm doing now, why I still continue reading Jewish books, why I'm still doing everything that I'm still doing, why I listen to Daniel Gordas on a daily basis. I don't know why. Um, is that at some point I, I finally turned that switch off to find out, no, they're not necessarily smarter than I am. They're not necessarily more learned than I am. They may know more in this or that with this rabbi or that rabbi. But at the end of the day, I've done enough of my work to be qual to qualify myself, at least, I believe, to be smart in the Jewish world. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore, I'm comfortable in Jewish settings, whether it be humanitarian Judaism or secular Judaism or ultra-Orthodox Judaism. Um, there are spaces in both that I'm very uncomfortable. 
Mm -hmm. I don't like certain spaces at the Western Wall in Jerusalem. I am yeah. extremely uncomfortable in many spaces there. I intentionally wear a love is love, very colorful t-shirt when I'm at the Western Wall today. Yeah. Because I'm angry about much of what's happening there. Um, I would much rather celebrate at the Southern Wall excavations than I would at the Western Wall. Mm -hmm. um, but I got to tell you, when you touch that wall and you feel the electricity of the millions of other peoples that have touched that wall, pretty hard not to want to be there sometimes. So there's that space. Um, um, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> there's um, there's also, I've been in space where when my, when my father, blessed memory, and then when my mother, blessed memory, when Shiva had to be done and when Shloshim had to be done, and when, I'm sorry, when the morning periods after their mm -hmm. death of the seven days, the 30 days in the annual, where I'm going to pray once or twice a day, every day for a year, um, and then beyond, um, where do you go? What do you do when there are a variety of synagogues that would obviously welcome me, but many of my synagogues aren't don't have daily prayer services. They have Friday, Saturday, sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, they don't mm -hmm. necessarily have it on a daily basis. Um, I can surround myself by a dozen or more Jews at any given moment at the JCC, but there's no prayer services taking place there. I kind of begged, wanted to beg for that to change, but that was too selfish for me to do, and I wouldn't wouldn't do that, and I wouldn't right. want to challenge our community with that issue. Right. Um, and I will tell you that, <clears throat> therefore, going to the different synagogues, going to ASKT for prayers, going to Beth Israel for prayers, going to Sinai, going to Shalom, going to um, Emmanuel, going to, I mean, Beth Yehuda, it was, mm -hmm. I mean, and then and these are all Milwaukee these synagogues, all Milwaukee which, which fit all range, of the spectrum yes, yeah. of Jewish practice. And what's so great about all of us, every one of them was, was were incredibly coddling to me. Mm -hmm. um, I, I I knew that being, I'll use Rabbi Tversky as an example. I need, mm -hmm. knew that being in Rabbi Tversky's, right, all three generations mm -hmm. would be so welcoming of me in their space during that time. They they knew my mom. They knew my dad. They they found and they know me, mm -hmm. and it was a very very warm and cuddly space to be. Interestingly, going back in my in, in in that case, three generations. Well, actually, two one generation older than than than, than Michal Tversky to his father with mm -hmm. my father, um, down to Chaim with me, and and Ben Sion is actually closer to my age. But but the point is that there's there's a multi generational relationship there as opposed to a relatively new relationship with Rabbi Alter at, 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 um, at Israel, at Israel and Tamid. And, and yet I, I was equally, like I said, equally as comfortable going to both places. So, um, and yet in neither place would I ever want to lead services. Yeah. Because even though I can, that's not where I want to put my efforts. I, I, it's really interesting. It's like kind of a conundrum because, or not a conundrum, it's kind of a, a puzzle because I should be, confident and comfortable and I am I just don't like doing that I don't quite know why I haven't quite answered I'm going to follow up with that in a moment uh, uh, I'm going to ask where you do want to lead services I'm taking a note on this thought right where you do want to lead services actually I don't anywhere oh okay yeah, I just I just it's I do my own Passover Seder right and I've taught for ever yes in all these different places so that's your form so yeah that's my that's my yeah. space I want to lead okay um I have loved taking trips to Israel and being a guide for, I mean, not only yeah. for the eighth graders, but for many of my friends. And I've led a few of those trips and those have been awesome. Taking adult trips to Israel has been, been great. Is it specifically because of prayer, an ambiguous relationship with prayer? Is it because maybe this is still a place of not so much confidence or? I'll give you a secret. Okay. It's not such a secret because I've shared this before. <laughs> <laughs> um, my dad nailed it. He, um, he said of God's existence, I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, the relationship of the Jewish people with that God, I have no doubt. Mm -hmm. And I just love that. I love that. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't doubt that there's a Jewish God out there, not because it's necessarily a God out there, but because there's a relationship we've created with this thing called God mm -hmm. and um, and that God with us. Mm -hmm. It's no question why we are still alive and still around. Um, but I don't believe in a vengeful God. I don't believe in an omniscient God. I don't believe in an omnipotent God. Um, because if I did, I would be living a very, very different lifestyle. I would probably be much more orthodox than I am if I did that. Mm -hmm. um, but I do believe in um, in that relationship we have with that omnipotent, omnipotent and omniscient and all-knowing and all-being God. 
even if I don't necessarily believe that exists. I can't help but be that kid at Bethel Synagogue on the West Side where Rabbi Switchko gave me an image of, 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 of of, right. of, a, of a god that was some old man with a beard and then yeah, right. Yeah, and I just don't. I, that's not. That's just not my Jewish god. That's yeah. just not the space. I, I love telling a story when I, I was challenged once because we were going to hike to base camp Everest, and when I looked at the dates. It was already on a preset date. It was not my. I couldn't change the dates, um, and it was going to be over the high holidays. It's going to be over Rosh Hashanah. And I thought, well, how do I do this? Like, how do I? skip Rosh Hashanah. I mean, that, that's just that's just not an option. I'm with my daughter, but I'm not with my wife. I'm not with my son. I'm not with my mom who was still alive at the time. I mean, what do I do? Um, <laughs> I didn't ask permission, by the way. I was a grown adult, so I didn't necessarily <laughs> ask permission for my mom. She was not exactly all that thrilled about it. Um, but I told her I'm going to take my shofar with me. And I really oh, like yes. blow very well. But I took my shofar with me, and I um, I got to meet a bunch of Israelis as we're hiking up to, to base camp. And I, I told them that on you know the volume on, on when the day comes, I plan on blowing a shofar and it will be up at night at um uh, Teng mm -hmm. And um lo and behold on the day of it, I told the group that was with me and there were several Jews with us and yeah. I went downstairs and blow the shofar. And if and by the way, the, the mitzvah for Rosh Hashanah to actually fulfill the mitzvah of the, the fulfill the obligation to the holiday mm -hmm. is to listen to the sound of the shofar. Yes. So technically, I was fulfilling the mitzvah for yes, fulfilling my responsibility for for, for Rosh Hashanah so and helping yeah. and helping others yes. celebrate it as well. So I get to the mountaintop, and we're several I don't know thirteen thousand feet up in the in the in, in God's air, and I blow the shofar as loud and as well as I can. And I'm <clears> not the best shofar blower, but I got mm -hmm. the kiyah and I got shvarim and I got shruah. I got all the sounds out that I needed to. And the next day. Uh, on the trail, all these Israelis popped up out of nowhere. Wow. And this is all in Hebrew. That was yeah. fantastic. Thank you yeah. for doing that. It was just absolutely amazing. So I guess I've led services. Yes. <laughs> yes. And I, maybe that's the case. Maybe I just, I know I can never replicate that again. So I, I <laughs> <laughs> you, you peaked I just, I at peaked, the top of the top mountain. Of the top yeah. Of the top. <laughs> so yeah. Um, so yeah, I don't know that I want to do it again. I also think that there's a certain, like, this is where I can take off my, my coat. Maybe mm -hmm. it's because somebody else can do it. And I don't, it's a mm -hmm. space that I don't have to do it. Mm -hmm. There's somebody who is ridiculously qualified to do so. And that's also true. And one of the pleasures, if I really believe that what Rabbi Talishka was saying about literacy, they're more literate than I am. Let them enjoy the thrill they're doing with it. And um, so, yeah, it's a space I don't want to be in. Great. Uh -oh. Oops. Sorry, something just popped up on my screen here. One moment. All right. Yeah. So I'm thinking of some people who are going to be watching and or listening to this conversation. And I think there'll be a great number who will feel inspired or galvanized by the, the idea that <clears throat> I can learn a little more, I can do a little bit more, and really grow that, that confidence and that self-confidence. I anticipate some people thinking something like, what's that amount, right? In other words, how much do I have to learn? Or, I, I don't think you mean it this way, the the unintended message could be something like, well, I don't know enough, right? It kind of gets back to that. I'm not a good enough Jew. I'm a bad Jew. I don't know enough yet. How would you share that same message for someone who has that sense that they don't know enough yet, that only once I learn that as much as most or only once I get to here, can I start to feel confident? And I know that you weren't saying that, right? Thank, actually, yeah, thanks, right. actually, thank you for the clarification. Because mm -hmm. you're right. That it, yeah. that was, it, was, it was never an intention for... Because you speak about yourself case. personally. Correct. Right, you speak about yourself personally. This, 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 exactly. this is my exactly. own choice. I, I do believe, let me, let, me, let me change this though. I do believe mm -hmm. that in order for us to have certain kind of... In order for us to talk, we have to have a common language, right? right. If I was speaking Swahili right now and you were speaking Hebrew, we wouldn't be able to communicate. Right. And there are Except some... for pajamas and... <laughs> Except for pajamas and telephone. Pajamas and telephone. So um, there's no question that we would be... We, we need to have some level of, of knowledge in order to have the communication. That doesn't necessarily mean we can't have just simply pure joy in, in the space world, mm -hmm. right? You don't have to be a, 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 a Judaic scholar to mm -hmm. enjoy the beauty of Shabbat. Um, I found more beauty in Shabbat after I read Heschel's book on the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. And I actually would argue that anybody who did read Heschel's book, The Sabbath, mm -hmm. is going to enjoy Shabbat more. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean you have to have read the book in order to get there. Yes. Um, yes. 
I also would say, I would also argue that you don't have to travel to base camp Everest to see the beauty of the world, right? Mm -hmm. You can, you can find it an infinite number of places before you have to necessarily go there. Doesn't mean you shouldn't go to base camp Everest to do that. I, I would argue that's the same exact way that I look at Judaism. If I have the opportunity to get to know Heschel better mm -hmm. and to read his books and it's going to change the way I look at things. Yeah. Why wouldn't I? Yeah. That doesn't necessarily mean I can't enjoy like, <laughs> I was traveling one time with the Federation to Argentina. We had this amazing opportunity to go to a to a gathering for Jewish for the, for the Federations of North Jewish Federations of North America had a gathering in of all places in Argentina to learn about the community. There we actually we, we 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 took a it was it was a spectacular trip, really really amazing trip. Really got a chance to dive deep into the culture that people were there. And while we were there, we went to a particular restaurant, a vegan restaurant, mm -hmm. as I am. Yep. And they had a ch dense chocolate dessert. And it was absolutely unbelievable. And there's actually a photograph of me eating this thing. I couldn't talk for about 45 seconds to a minute. My my mouth was just, I, I it was, it was stupendous. It was absolutely just amazing. I've never had anything like that before and never anything like that since. Mm -hmm. Arguably, why would I ever want to have another piece of dessert again? If it's never going to be like that, right. again, why would I want to do this? Right. But instead, you have dessert here and there, yeah. knowing that it may not be like that. That's kind of the way I want to look at the way I live my Jewish life. Mm -hmm. um, are there going to be moments like when Sid and Gabe were born, where you just have these unbelievable moments where it's just beyond anything you could have believed it before? Um, where you said for the first time that, you know, that there's this wonderful our prayer of Shachiano, right? Where you... You thank God for arriving, for being, for letting me have this opportunity to exist at this particular moment in time. Sorry, but when you get to Base Camp Everest and you say that, it's pretty special. Mm -hmm. Now, what about all the other people around me who didn't get to say Sheikh Yanu? Were they having any less of a time than I was? Absolutely not. Many of them were in their own headspace doing it. I happened to be in a headspace that included the Sheikh Yanu. Mm -hmm. No better, no mm -hmm. worse. It was my space. And the truth was, when we all kind of looked at each other, we were all giggling in whatever Sheikh Yanu moment we were each in. It was one of those places that really were just absolutely amazing. I will tell you that when the eighth graders get to the top of Masada, that's one of those spaces where they just get this giggly moment where they're watching the sunrise. I mean, it's yeah. just, how do you not have that? Um, although, by the way, they giggle at a lot of things anyway. So That's their job. Yeah, that's their responsibility. Exactly. So, yeah. exactly. You, know, you talk about one possibility of why you aren't drawn to lead prayer services in synagogues, that you can kind of take that quote off, that there are other people who can do it. You said do it better, but other people who can do it. Uh, and sometimes it's nice not to feel like you need to step into something. Are there, if you had a, a if you could snap your fingers and make something happen, mm -hmm. what would your deep hope be for us as Jews that we could just do more of this? Everything's a process. Everything is learning. Um, and again, like you're saying, it's not to diminish where we are. But if you just had a wish that there's something that we as Jews could just do, right? That you right. didn't have to is, is get along an option? <laughs> sure. <laughs> I mean, yeah. There's probably there's probably that. There's probably enjoy more of it mm -hmm. um, or get more joy out of it. Mm -hmm. Give it another chance. That's actually something that's been probably a theme of my life where my generation, I'm in my 60s now. I'm guessing those who are in their 50s, you know what? I don't even, I'm not going to, I'm going to erase the age. Okay. There are those who, for whatever reasons, have written off Judaism as a, as a topic. Mm -hmm. um, and I would like each one of them, to, if I could snap my fingers, give Judaism a second chance, not the way you did it the first time. I actually think that would be a pretty, a pretty important thing to do differently. I did. I lucked out where it wasn't just the classic um, ways of studying Torah, whether it was Sunday school or Hebrew school, whatever the things were. It's one thing when when you're when you're immersed in a society and a culture where language is as important as being able to communicate, right? I mean, this is it's how I'm gonna be able to talk to friends, how I'm gonna even make friends is you gotta speak the language, right? I, I would you know my first friend in Israel was Yossi. Why? Because Yossi spoke English. Mm -hmm. So Yossi was my best friend. I didn't really like Yossi. Oh, <laughs> Yossi's a good person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, but it wasn't like I, I wanted to have more friends than just Yossi. But so you learn the language. Mm -hmm. Um, I wasn't getting that out of the programs that were available here. It's nobody's fault. It just wasn't the system that worked to teach a language. Um, yet 
now I speak Hebrew because I was lucky to have the opportunity to do it differently. Um, kosher food. I mean, how much of our lives have we had really bad kosher food? When in fact, there's really delicious kosher food out there. Give it a second chance. Um, educators. Many of us have had, unfortunately, we've had maybe had great success with other educators in my life and not such great success with Jewish educators in our life. That's a shame because there's a lot of first ones, a lot of really good ones out there. Um, I love taking on the eighth grade trip. One of the things that I, I, I could cherish was knowing there's a particular guide, and I'm going to am going to mention her name because she is one of my favorite educators on this planet. Shoshana Yudelman is a teacher at uh, Yad Vashem. She's a guide there, and she's brilliant, and she's kind, and she's lovely, and her personality comes out, and she's a, she just exudes all of, all the goodness in the world is in, is in Shoshana. And when she teaches, and when she teaches our children, they they can't help but just have aha moments. That's what I want. If I could snap my fingers, I would like us to have more aha moments in Judaism, to give it a mm -hmm. chance that they otherwise we we have forgotten. With your permission, I'm going to steal, well, borrow some yeah, of that language please. because that's a lot of what I'm hoping to do with on your Judaism. Right, a lot of the people I talk to have had either a negative experience, never really felt they had that positive experience. So they just distance themselves from Judaism. They look for things in other places. And there are many wonderful places yes. to explore. But I love that idea of just try it again. Yeah. Give it a give it a shot. Try it differently. So, you know, it's yeah. interesting. I, I I love the book and I love the story that um, the Dalai Lama is exiled. Okay. And he's trying to figure out how he's going to survive in a world in exile. And the Dalai Lama is a pretty smart man. He realizes, wait a second, there's a whole bunch of people out there who have done this for their existence. How the Jews survived in exile. Mm -hmm. So the story is called, the, the book is called The Jew and the Lotus. Mm -hmm. And it's the Dalai Lama turning to his Jewish friends and say, can you please come here and tell me how you do this? And the book is this wonderful book about these Jews who go to meet with the Dalai Lama who are going to, and they're going to explain to the Dalai Lama how we have survived as a people in exile. I think we all need to be Dalai Lama. And we all need to just stop for a minute. I love the fact that there's things called Jubus, right? Yes. Jewish yes, Buddhists. Yes. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I practice a little bit of yoga here and there. I don't think I've lost my sight in Judaism because I practice yoga. Yeah. I don't think there's anything wrong with me reading, you know, books on Judea on Buddhism. No. I think there's some beautiful space there. I would even argue that the fact that I've been my toes have been deep pretty dipped pretty seriously in um, the Catholic Jewish Conference, the interfaith community, uh, interfaith community in Milwaukee. There's been other places where I've I've, I've I've been on the boards of, I've, I've, mm -hmm. I've lectured with, I've taught with. Um, we, the, the more we learn about the way the others look at us or the way we look at them is another space of how we can give it another chance or let them understand it. I was giving a talk um, at a church in Milwaukee not that long ago. Um, and, and I was challenged by a question somebody threw out about, about Israel in the crowd. And I realized that it was a question that was asked by a particular person at this particular place. Had I been the old me that never really evolved, mm -hmm. one that would have been, I would have just been angry at her for saying it there. Mm -hmm. But it's not her fault there. It's that everywhere. It's not that church's fault that that's happening. Right. Um, it's right. just kind of spaces that we're in. So, yeah, I... I guess I, I would have set my fingers. So, yeah, I please don't yeah, steal it. Steal yeah, it. I'm going to give it a second chance. That's amazing. And maybe even a third and fourth sometimes, because that's <laughs> right. Because right. your second chance may still be with the wrong, you know, wrong opportunity. So exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, if you were to take a couple moments to reflect on your Jewish life, is there anything in particular that you're proud of? Like something that you're like, I am really glad I worked on this. I wrestled with this, or that this has been a passion of mine, or that I shared with someone else. Anything, and it might be more than one thing, but anything in particular. Let me, let me give a yeah. couple, actually. There's a yeah. couple that just jump, jump out right away. They were circumstantially not mine to own. They were mm -hmm. my kids to own. But the decision to have, to celebrate, not to have to, to have celebrated Sid and Gabe's um, uh, Baden Bar Mitzvah in Israel mm -hmm. was really spectacular. We, we chose to, they were at the day school as, as students. They were uh, surrounded by kids who were having, you know, Bar Bat Mitzvah celebration weekend after weekend after weekend. And I turned to, turned to them, Deb, and I said, you know, would you want to do something different? Should we go and do this in Israel? Yeah. But we didn't just go to a place in Israel. We did it differently. <laughs> we did it with a little bit more flair. So for Sid's Bat Mitzvah celebration, we did it at um, at a kibbutz in northern Israel for one part of the services on Shabbat morning. Um, but the Friday evening service was actually done at Rabbi Meir Arbeli's 
synagogue on oh. Mount Arbel overlooking the Sea of Galilee. And that particular synagogue has not been used for about a thousand years. Mm -hmm. um, it's been destroyed for about a thousand years. And we went to it in its destruction. And we <laughs> tripped up thinking about it. We brought Jewish life back to a space that wasn't Jewish, for, mm -hmm. wasn't celebrated it for a long time. And it was my daughter's own. That was awesome. It was really, really, really awesome. Um, <laughs> and then it's Rabbi, Rabbi Nadell asking, I said, how, what, how are you gonna possibly I'll do this for Gabe? <laughs> you do what to do for his. It's like you just blew the show far here. Like, what do you do next? Like, yeah. Yeah. next? Yeah. Uh, so it came Gabe's turn. And, and again, we, we went back to Israel for Gabe. And in Gabe's case, he we went to uh, Omo Kanatir, or uh, now it's called Chateau de Rechavam for Rechavam, it's a synagogue on the Golan Heights that had also fallen in a complete and total um, disrepair, was destroyed. Mm -hmm. um, and we did the same thing there. We brought life back to this one. The beautiful part about that one is that it's been completely restored. It's now mm -hmm. literally been block after block after block using this amazing new technology. They were actually able to use the sitting stones that were there that have been collapsed and actually rebuilt much of it using what was already on the spot. So just a spectacular location. So. But for his, I forgot about this, um, on, on his uh, era of there, it was um, the song um, from Hare, when, when the moon is in the seventh star and right, aligns right. with Mars. Yep. It happened to align that night. Yeah. Uh, they were exactly yeah. Aquarius. So um, it aligned, everything was lined up that night. So here we are on this mountaintop in the Golan. Uh, the Kinaret is down below. The stars are aligned above us. And it was November 29th. It was the um, uh, declaration of, uh, of Israel as a state, pre-state Israel. Ah. Um, and it was one of those things where it was like, you know, ka-ching. <laughs> it's like we pulled it off for Gabe. It was it was literally the perfect the perfect bar mitzvah celebration. Um, and the winds were howling. In fact, it was really beautiful. I just remember this. When Gabe started chanting, uh, the jackals and the, and the coyotes in the area started howling back. <laughs> oh, cool. It was just, it was just magical. Oh, it's Absolutely amazing. magical. So, yeah, those were... Wow. Those were two of those things that were magical, really wow. amazing. Um, and I think maybe that is an answer. Maybe the way of living more fulfilled Jewish life isn't just finding the uniqueness, but the joy in any of the mundane. Mm -hmm. And by the way, I will argue that I've had many mundane spaces become enrichingly Jewish circumstantially by the nod of a friend. Mm -hmm. um, when my father passed away, I went to, I walked to, I had to, I needed to be outside a lot. And I walked from our house to Congregation Beth Israel, which is a good, I don't know, I'm guessing three mile, three and a half mile walk. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's a schlep, a little bit of a schlep. Felt great. <laughs> um, and I sat down and Dr. Jerry Rosen, our family's vet from 1964, Nuji. Um, I sat down and I was, I was messed up. I was, this was the first Shabbat after my father passed away. It was my, my, my father, my partner, my mentor, my business partner, I, I adored him. Um, Jerry Rosen came over and after a few minutes and sat down next to me and I was not in a good space. And he put his hand on my leg and this is mundane Shabbat services. This is nothing special. Um, if there is such a thing called mundane Shabbat services, but anyway, mm -hmm. you know, he put his hand on my, on my leg and he said, my father has passed for decades. I think about him every day, and you're going to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. And I looked over <laughs> at Dr. Rosen, and he was just, tears are just flowing down his face, and tears are just flowing down my face. And for those few minutes, Shabbat was magical. Mm -hmm. And could it have happened at a church on a Tuesday? Maybe. Right. Maybe. But it wasn't. It was at that Shabbat services during the time when I was in, in mourning for my father, where I intentionally went to a space to be Jewish and a friend and other made me find even more of a Jewish space. And it was something that has filled me with a joy until today. And it's it's interesting because amongst the things that I'll do for my father's Dorset, for my father's memorial is amongst the things that always come up. So it's been 15, 16 years now. Jerry Rosen comes up each and every time wow. I think about it. So yeah, those are the things that, how do we elevate our joy in Judaism? It, which is, by the way, a mitzvah, right? How do, why do we drink out of right. a kiddush cup instead right. of out of a plastic cup? Because we want to glorify the mm -hmm. act of doing something. So find this. Maybe that's it. Maybe it's not just give it a second chance, but give it a second chance with a how do you add a little more glory to it? That's beautiful. How do you put more jelly beans in it? <laughs> yeah. First of all, thank you for your time. Thank you for your this wisdom. Awesome. Thank you for your stories. And also that 
I mean, lots of things can be intimidating. And certainly if someone does feel a bit of a distance from any faith practice, it doesn't have to be from Judaism, the idea of how you step back toward it. And thank you for sharing so many personal stories. Some of them are big, like these big momentous events, and some are these just moments in time. And the idea that anyone can just try to create a moment of sanctity or holiness or, or connection in any given moment, um, hopefully that's a low barrier, right? You know, it's like, I don't have to do everything. It doesn't have to be omnipresent. It doesn't have to define everything about me. But at this one moment, I'm going to try something. Try it again. Try it anew. Try it a different way. And hopefully some magic will come out of it. So thank you for that inspiration. Thank you for that. Thanks hope. for having me. This is wonderful. Thank you again. And thank you to everyone who is uh, watching live or who's watching afterwards. Uh, again, this is uh, my friend and my guest, Moshe Katz. I am Moshe Steigman, the Mindful Rabbi. And thank you for joining an On Your Judaism live stream conversation.